Um, hey everyone, uh, welcome and good afternoon to um, um, all of you. Um, I'm very happy um, to be here. My name is Kenneth and I run the institutional uh, business here at DBS Vickers. Um, we've all seen how digital disruption is now the norm, um, but as more and more professional investors um, get involved and starts looking at digital assets um, and the entire ecosystem, the more there is need for governance and security um, and stability. Um, and DBS, you know, um, being a digital bank um, and our hopes of being the number one in the digital field, um, we want to be able to balance uh, both um, um, security as well as innovation um, so that uh, professional investors will be able to participate in this field. Um, so we are starting a whole series of these webinars um, talking about digital assets. Um, this is aimed both at um, participants in this sector so that we they can invest better, but this is also this is also being targeted um, at um, traditional equity investors who wants to learn more about what's happening in this space as, as well. Um, Taimo um, and his team. Um, um, Taimo is our chief economist. Uh, today he's being joined by both Nathan um, as well as Wei Liang. Um, his team has recently put together a primer on digital assets and it's titled um, Digital Currency, um, Digital Currency, Public and uh, Private Present and Future. Um, Taimo um, has been uh, working in um, Asia Pacific for, for, for more than 20 years now, uh, both in central banks as well as in, in, as in commercial banks. Um, he's also worked in Washington, D.C. Um, as part of IMF. Um, but over and above that, recently he's been most well known for championing uh, all things digital, uh, whether you're talking about fintech or digital assets. Um, but he really believes that this is really going to transform uh, the financial industry. Um, so the primer has been done. I would like today's talk to be really just a starting point for us to start on this journey together. Um, I want to be able to build this community so that we can all bounce ideas off each other. So let this be the start of this whole series, um, and there'll be more coming after that. Uh, with that, can I pass it off to Taimo, please? Uh, thank you so much, Kenneth. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, we have indeed put out not only a primer on digital currencies over the past month, month and a half. We have also done a webinar. We've also done a podcast with uh, one of the largest uh, digital asset managers in the world. So we are getting the word out and sitting here in Singapore, particularly exposed to China, uh, how can you not be uh, taken in by the digital wave that is going on right now? Now, mind you, the act of transferring money through digital means is not at all new. Um, the U.S. Federal Reserve started using Telegraph to settle accounts with its member banks way back in 1918, 1919, more than a century ago. In fact, Western Union, as soon as the Western railways were set up to connect the U.S. East Coast with the Midwest and further west, in as uh, early as 1890s, was taking telegraphic instructions to move money around. So moving money around through electronic means is by no means new. In fact, central bank to commercial bank, digital ledgers and transfer of money going beyond the telegraphic means, but actual electronic means the way we think about it today is also almost 50 years old. Uh, in fact, if you think about it, digital currencies on the private side, particularly Bitcoin is more than a decade old. So mm -hmm. nothing that we're gonna discuss today is absolutely brand new, but what is happening is over the last three, four years, this confluence of internet connectivity, mobile capability, and the amazing storage and processing power that we now have at our fingertips has made lots of transactions mathematically, which were feasible years, decades ago, but now they're completely in real time possible. Uh, hence, even a few years ago, you could have had Bank of England write somewhat uh, dismissively about how their real time growth settlement system is super fast, super efficient, super safe, something even a few years ago was viewed that the private space should not be able to replicate, especially with the uh, enormous computational requirement that you have with something like Bitcoin and distributed ledger. But those views are changing. And the 
government that is perhaps most attuned to this profound changes going on right now is the government of China. Although at the beginning, we used to talk a lot about like Sweden, uh, the, the Riks Bank is, you know, at the cutting edge. I think that is behind us. If there's one government, one central bank authority that is absolutely serious about the disruptive impact of digital payments and what it means for conventional central banking, or even our notion of what money is, it's the PBOC and the government of China. And hence, uh, you will see a lot of our attention and work that is going to take place going forward would be centered around what the Chinese are doing and how that is influenced to the rest of the world. So I have the pleasure of having with me two of my colleagues who are part of a larger team that worked on the primer and will be engaged in quarterly updates going forward. Uh, Chang Wei-Liang and Nathan Chow are with us. Uh, Wei-Liang is based in Singapore. Nathan is in Hong Kong joining us live. Um, what will happen in the coming half an hour or so is that Wei-Liang will go first go over the conceptual issues, uh, both with respect to central bank digital currency as well as private digital currency. And then Nathan will touch on again, as I just said, the most exciting frontier of digital payments right now, which is China and what's happening there and what are the exciting developments in the pipeline. So with that, I'm gonna stop. I'll come back during the question and answer session, but for now, I'm gonna let uh, Wei Liang take over. Thank you, Taima. So uh, digital currencies, I think they are fairly revolutionary. They are prompting a paradigm shift in the way we are thinking about money. Uh, even with electronic money, previously you could still think of them as basically coins, uh, the same meaning as they were uh, when they were first minted many, many uh, centuries ago. But digital currencies, they break this old mental model. They have changed uh, to become malleable software or more like programmable money. So when people start seeing currencies in such a new light, uh, there's a wave of innovation. We see many novel applications being developed in this space, uh, such as uh, self-enforcing smart contracts. So these are brave new frontiers uh, with tantalizing prospects of uh, mass adoption in the future. So the brave new frontiers, the first wave of digital currencies are cryptocurrencies. They rely on cryptographic methods uh, to maintain a decentralized distributed ledger, uh, otherwise known as a blockchain. So this blockchain is shared across many computers or nodes. There's no single actor with full control over this entire network. So any node can come and go uh, as they wish. So this ledger is actually used as a record of transactions and ownership uh, with transactions booked via a consensus protocol. And that allows the usage of cryptocurrencies effectively as money. So the combination of being decentralized and di distributed results in a very high degree of robustness and resilience to attack. So central banks soon noticed how popular the cryptocurrencies were getting. Uh, they were intrigued enough to, be, to begin experiments with their own version of programmable money. So these new currencies don't necessarily share all the characteristics of cryptocurrencies. And then Therefore, they are more accurately described as central bank digital currencies or CBDCs. They hold the same value as their physical counterparts, but because of the programmable nature, uh, they can bring about additional accessibility and efficiency compared to traditional payment channels, uh, encouraging financial innovation. And of course, the development of these digital currencies by both private and public actors are further reinforced by the concurrent rise in digital payments. This was already a trend before the pandemic, and it's likely to have risen even more so this year as the pandemic leads to more people staying at home and transacting online. So amidst this fast expanding uh, number of digital payment channels, CBDC is one way that can enhance interoperability for all of them. So let's go deeper first into what defines a cryptocurrency. So cryptocurrency. Uh, bona fide cryptocurrencies can be distinguished with, uh, by looking for five key features. Uh, the first is that they are all distributed, where ownership and transaction records are committed in a shared ledger known as a blockchain, uh, distributed over the entire computer network. So this ensures a very high degree of resilience and fault tolerance to crashes or network outages, but at a cost of higher computing resources. Second is that uh, cryptocurrency will have a consensus protocol which determines how the network determines or agrees on what transactions are valid 
in the shared ledger. So one of the very amazing things about uh, cryptocurrencies is that it enable parties who don't know anything about one another to easily form a consensus on what transactions have occurred. So for Bitcoin, the nodes will accept the largest proof of work to be true. Uh, there's also another protocol known as proof of stake, uh, where validators put out a stake on the blockchain, where a correct transaction is rewarded and a dishonest transaction is penalized by reducing uh, the stake. So that links very closely with that characteristic, which is that of an incentive for transaction validators uh, to provide computing resources to ensure the transactions are entered honestly into the blockchain. Uh, Bitcoin will reward validators with a new uh, Bitcoin uh, if they solve a hash inversion problem correctly in a process that's also known as mining. Other cryptocurrencies could reward by giving fees for lodging transactions in the blockchain. And fourth, there is some algorithm that determines the creation and the release of the crypto uh, token. So Bitcoin uses the mining process to release a fixed amount of Bitcoin over time, up to a maximum of 21 million coins. Uh, others could be backed by conventional currencies, in which case the amount of outstanding coins will be determined by the amount of reserves being held. And finally, the divisibility of cryptos. Uh, due to their entirely digital nature, and unlike uh, other conventional money. So you cannot split a one cent coin into two halves and still expect to use it. But for the Bitcoin, uh, you can not just split it a thousand times or a million times, but you can split it up to 100 million times for transactions. Uh, so now we are clear on um, what are the features of cryptocurrencies. Let's start diving deeper to look at how uh, a specific one, block Bitcoin, operates. So Bitcoin uh, is the innovation that started this, uh, this wave of cryptocurrencies back in 2008 uh, via a paper written uh, by somebody under the pseudonym of Satoshi Nakamoto. So how it works is that they exist in a peer-to-peer -peer computer network holding a shared ledger with transactions signed by owners with private keys. So a single Bitcoin is then just a series of transactions, or as you can see in this diagram over here, a block. Um, Nakamoto's insight is that these Bitcoin blocks um, can be added one after another onto the blockchain, but only after doing some computationally difficult task, so that it becomes increasingly infeasible for an attacker to go back to change a previous block after the blockchain has grown, because it will require him to compute a solution not just for his block, but all the subsequent blocks that come after it. So this is why uh, the longest chain is the honest chain in Bitcoin. It's almost impossible for an attacker to make a fraudulent chain longer than the honest chain without controlling over half of the network's compute power. So given a low chance of success, it makes more economic sense for the nodes to all behave honestly and earn their rewards via mining, which is what actually happens in reality. So we now know how Bitcoin as a technology works, but how does it stack out actually as an investment? So going on to the next slide. So what we notice is that Bitcoin, um, in terms of market cap, is already comparable to major listed corporations. Uh, its market cap was approaching about 200 billion back in June. It's now well above 200 billion. Some of this gain is probably due to outsized monetary and fiscal stimulus uh, enacted by central banks and governments all over the world. Uh, people start growing more worried about inflation and excessive debt burdens. But what is sure is that Bitcoin is no longer just a, a hobbyist interest or a fad for retail traders. So consider the Grayscale Bitcoin Trust, which was the first that allowed easy investment access in Bitcoin. So the table here shows that the trust biggest holders are all institutional investors. So now we know Investors are taking the Bitcoin in droves, but is it as good as it seems, right? So there is, to be honest, plenty of crypto skepticism, uh, even up to today. So let's take a look at what are some of uh, the arguments people are making against Bitcoin. So there are many economists who have voiced uh, skepticism over cryptocurrencies. And that's not very surprising because every time a radical idea first surfaces, it naturally generates a lot of controversy. Uh, and opposition, but let's consider what the arguments are against, uh, let's say, uh, Bitcoin. Because Bitcoin has no intrinsic value. It's not a precious commodity like gold or silver. Neither is there a central bank that guarantees price stability of any sort, unlike fiat money. 
And that brings it to a second negative, which is that Bitcoin is extremely volatile, right? which undermines the idea of it being a store of value. Uh, third, Bitcoin uh, is really a technology. It's quite difficult to access and very somewhat uneconomic to use. Uh, to broadcast Bitcoin transactions, uh, you will need to run a full node with the entire blockchain stored on your computer, right? Which is about 290 gigabyte in size. And with the number of transactions coming through every year, it's expected to grow about 20 gigabyte a year. So non-technical people will find it uh, difficult and they'll probably be relying on third parties to, uh, to access uh, Bitcoin. So this brings out a fourth vulnerability, which is that uh, there's a risk of a loss of Bitcoins by custodians, right? If they have security breaches. And finally, due to the anonymous decentralized nature of Bitcoin, there are many unsavory actors uh, using the network for possibly illegal transactions. But are uh, these insurmountable problems? So there are a few ways you can look at it. So the counterpoint to the intrinsic value argument is that there is value in the cryptocurrency, but it stems from its network effect or whether there's a large and growing network of users who are willing to transact with it. Uh, it's almost akin to a social network where something becomes more and more valuable uh, as increasing number of people use it. So due to the simplicity and security of the Bitcoin protocol over the years, more users are adopting it, more developers are working to enhance it. So uh, that really helps anchor the value of Bitcoin. Uh, it wouldn't go to zero because it's actually being used in real life transactions by real people, right? So second argument for Bitcoin is that the volatility that Bitcoin has can be tolerated if it can produce some diversification in your portfolio. And one of the principles of modern finance is that the value of an asset is not based on its volatility, right? It's based on its correlation or its beta with the market. So this is a very well-known result known as a capital asset pricing model. So if Bitcoin offers you some diversification benefit against the market portfolio, then it should have a positive weight uh, in your portfolio, despite the kind of volatility that, that it has. So in this aspect, uh, I would say the patch that Bitcoin offers is unique and quite valuable. It's an insurance against catastrophic failure of the economic and financial system. Arguably, it's a very small tail risk, but it's important to some people, uh, especially uh, citizens of emerging markets where the risk surveillance is uh, not particularly strong or for countries where they are naturally vulnerable to uh, disasters. Uh, so without any state or capital controls, it's very likely you can assess your Bitcoin stash much easier than assessing money in a bank account uh, in, in a kind of natural disaster scenario. All you need is connection to the Bitcoin network. So the way is even more convenient than physical gold, which largely serves the same uh, safe haven purpose. So, and uh, that brings up a third point, which is that Bitcoin investment has also become a little easier over time uh, due to various financial innovation. Uh, the Grayscale Bitcoin Trust is one notable one. Uh, it's an investment vehicle that holds Bitcoin. It's traded in the US uh, OTC market. So Bitcoin investing is not as technically difficult as it is uh, before. And the fourth point is that uh, even though there is some risk of Bitcoin wallet losses due to organizational mishaps, uh, the Bitcoin network itself is actually super resilient and secure. Uh, there's no single point of failure uh, since the blockchain is really held by all nodes, right? So all computers in the net network. So consider that we have uh, cases where multi-trillion dollar companies such as Google or Microsoft having services outages. And it's really quite amazing that a completely distributed network like Bitcoin can still continue to function uh, largely without problems since existence. So uh, that also brings to us uh, the final point uh, that, that although Bitcoin has um, in the past been associated with uh, unsavory actors, the truth is that it has matured as a technology over time. So regulatory oversight is being expanded uh, to cover cryptocurrency uh, trading and payments in Singapore, for instance, uh, we have introduced the Payment Services Act. Uh, the rest of the world is likely to follow suit in terms of uh, introducing more regulation. So this enables Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies uh, to be used in more conventional settings without necessarily having to suffer kind of kind of stigma from being a user. So as a concluding thought, is it possible that we have cryptocurrency with this pros, but none of the cons. So this is perhaps one of the 
motivations behind central banks of developing CBDCs, right? And we can discuss this in the next slide. So let's take a deeper dive into what uh, central bank digital currencies. They are issued by central banks, uh, primarily for payments, but likely extensible uh, to be used for other pur purposes with uh, programming API. So there are two possible models. One is a single tier model in which central bank gives individuals direct access to CBDC. The other is a two tier model where the CBD access is given to payment providers who then interfaces with um, the individuals and corporate users. So most central banks are leaning towards the two-tier model um, due to concerns over bank disintermediation, but just having a central bank managing the CD CBDC will already reduce fragility compared to the high, high volatility cryptocurrencies, providing uh, some amount of assurance and safety in payments and also delivery on the efficiency gains uh, purported by uh, the, the, the cryptocurrencies. And for emerging markets, the benefit from providing this digital currency infrastructure is even greater because it helps with financial inclusion. So what this means is that emerging markets previously, well, much of their population is under bank. They don't have easy access to financial services, but with a CBDC infrastructure, it's much easier uh, for financial service providers uh, to provide services to them uh, using mobile phone technology, for instance, so all this will help in terms of addressing problems with financial underdevelopment. Um, CBDC has the potential to be a technology to solve uh, basically the endpoint gap problem, right? Where even if you have transactions using mobile phones, at the endpoints, there's some physical money that's being exchanged from person to a desk or to a shop. So there is still some risk involved uh, in this aspect. So with CBDC being tailored for payments and transfers, there will actually be no need for physical money across the entire uh, transaction chain. So at this point, it's becoming clear to central banks that payment providers are growing to become juggernauts, uh, not just in China, but I guess in the other parts of the world as well. So in, in the future, this could imply some financial risk uh, given so much money will be flowing through this or will be held by this payment provider. So having regulatory oversight, enhancing stability is another reason why central banks are developing CBDCs. Uh, furthermore, CBDCs can enhance interoperability between payment providers, uh, fostering greater competition and preventing uh, monopolistic uh, power from being held by a single company. And finally, rising usage of private currencies as opposed to uh, problems to monetary independence. Right now, it's an academic problem, but if you consider a case of emerging market economies, some of them are quite dollarized uh, and with dollars being used widely in transactions. So this similar phenomenon can easily happen if there's a loss of uh, confidence in the domestic currency and CBDC can help arrest the possible uh, usage of cryptocurrency replacing conventional currencies which in turn prevents a loss of monetary policy efficiency that has happened in some emerging market economies. So let's have a look at some of the design considerations uh, for CBDC. So right now about 80% of global central banks are thinking about implementing uh, CBDCs. Uh, some of those who are more advanced in terms of experimentation are deciding uh, what to choose among four different aspects. First, whether a CBDC will be token-based where value is linked uh, to the token or whether it's account-based where it's linked to a person-based account. Uh, the second uh, feature is whether it will be wholesale access provided uh, that's only limited to banks or it will be provided very widely uh, with retail access even to individuals that could include uh, non-resident tourists. A uh, third consideration is whether to whether your best interest, right? And more intriguingly, can it actually have a negative interest, which will open up some possibilities for monetary policy? And uh, the last point is whether to use a centralized or decentralized ledger. So PBOCs, DCEP, or digital currencies, uh, electric electronic payment will have loosely coupled account links. So there's some degree of anonymity. But not completely because it can be actually a uh, link back or trace back to a specific account. Uh, it will also not run on the blockchain, so avoiding a lot of inefficiencies with having distributed transactions is not fully decentralized. Uh, this, in the case of Sweden, the Riks Bank is testing various e implementations, so possibly the public will have a direct account 
uh, with the VIX Bank. In Singapore, MAS has experimented with a Sing Dollar on Ledger. This will be used for decentralized assessment, uh, and the Sing Dollar on Ledger will, will not be interest bearing. So, given this much interest developing in private and public digital currencies, we could ask what is the impetus driving all this, right? So, let's have a look at some of the factors on the next slide. So, um, the, the last chart over here on this slide shows an unmistakable global trend uh, in digital pay, towards digital payments. So the global value of digital payments is expected to double from this year, 2020 to 2024. And much of this growth will be uh, driven in, by Asia. So in an e, EIU survey, uh, they, they found that online payments is the number one reason why people uh, will consider using a digital currency. So or in, you can see this nexus of digital payments and digital currencies developing uh, into one of the fastest growing areas in finance uh, in, the, in the coming years. So it's very likely digital currencies will see a rise in take up given that increase in online transactions. So one of the countries that have fully embrace uh, mobile and digital online payments is China. Uh, and here Nathan will give you a granular picture of what's happening in the digital currency space there. Uh, over to you, Nathan. Thank you, William. Uh, and I totally agree with you. China is always at the forefront of the technology development, right? So uh, in the next 15 minutes, I will talk about the development of the CBDC in China. But before I do that, I would also like to spend a couple of minutes on the development of the whole crypto market in China. So uh, some of you may already know Asia plays an essential role in crypto market and China is right at the heart of the whole thing. For instance, China right now is the leader in terms of mining. So uh, let's turn to slide 12. Uh, I put up two charts there on the left. 65% right now uh, of the world's hash power comes from China, okay? So that is more than ninefold that of the US and Russia in, them, in terms of hash rate. Uh, hash rate is a measure of the power of the computers linked to the Bitcoin network. So which means the higher the rate, the higher the ability to produce new coins. Uh, and if we look at the right chart, very interestingly, about half of the coins is produced in just one place, which is the Xinjiang region. Uh, that makes up about 36% of the global total. And Xinjiang is followed by Sichuan and Inner Mongolia. Uh, the reason that China topping the list in terms of mining is actually pretty obvious because electricity there is, is, is cheap, uh, especially in the Western part of the country. And cheap ele uh, electricity is the crucial ingredient for mining. So that's why. However, in terms of trading volume, I would say it has already peaked in 2018, uh, if we look at China per se. Trading volume today is about one-tenth of the peak only. And the reason for the shrinking trading volume is that the government has found cryptocurrency like Bitcoin or Ethereum, they are not so safe. So they rolled out a lot of measures to, to, to contain the growth uh, a couple of years back. Uh, what I mean by not so safe is that because crypto are not regulated, uh, allowing capital fly skirting regulations, you know. So that uh, go against the country's capital account restrictions and the anti-corruption campaign, right? Because people could, could use them to get money out of the country uh, anonymously. And uh, the other reason is that the value of crypto could be, you know, quite volatile which means people could lose a lot of money in a very short period of time. In that case, that might create social inspect, uh, inst, in the, uh, inst, <clears throat> sorry, instability, I mean, right? So which is the last thing the uh, uh, Chinese government would like to see. So that's why started in 2017, the government issued a slew of legislations to contain the growth of trading of uh, cryptocurrency. So that's why trading volume has been shrinking since then. But uh, don't get me wrong, that does not mean the government do not, do not like the idea, they do. 
just that they want to figure out how to minim minimize the financial risk, but at the same time embrace the cashless technology. So there you go. Here comes the digital yuan. Uh, next slide, please. So the whole thing started about uh, like five months ago. China launched a trial of digital RMB in four cities, in Shenzhen, in Suzhou, Chengdu, and Songan. Uh, for example, in Suzhou, some public servants get paid in the e RMB. In other cities, the e RMB are mainly used in the services sector, like food and retail. Because the government has asked those popular fast food chains like McDonald's and Starbucks to join the trial. Online platforms like Meituan and Didi Chuxing are also helping the government to test the digital currency. And just about like two months ago, the government said that the trial will be extended uh, in Shanghai, in Beijing, and in the whole Greater Bay Area. So one of the questions that you might be asking is that why uh, Beijing is so eager to launch a, a, a digital currency? I can say the major reason is that uh, right now, today, cash in circulation is already very low. It has been shrinking. It has been declining over the past like eight to 10 years. And the reason is that the growth in mobile payment was so fast, so rapid. All right, so that greatly reduced the need for cash in China. So look at this chart here. M0 to GDP ratio has lowered to 8% today, right? It used to be very high, like 15% uh, during the year 2000 to 2010. And if we compare China with the rest of the world, China is considered one of the lowest in terms of cash intensity. We show that in the right chart, M0 to M2. So the ratio of that is among the lowest in the world in China, you see, not even 5%. In the US is like 25. In India, this number is close to 60%, all right? Uh, so, I guess for those of you who often go to China, for sure you know what these numbers mean. Because once you get out of the airport, basically you use mobile payments for everything, right? Like taxi, restaurants, supermarkets, convenience stores, you name it, right? Even street food sellers in small towns, right? So that's why the penetration ratio in China, slide 14 please, is way ahead of other countries in mobile payments, right? Let's see the chart on the left. More than 80% of smartphone users access payment apps in 2019 in China. Denmark is the second highest, but we're just talking about 40% in Denmark and close to 40% in South Korea, right? So the next question is why people in China are so into mobile payments. We have to understand that China is a mobile first country, meaning mobile payment is the first device for most people, for most internet users, not laptop, not desktop, all right? It's mobile phone. And the second reason is not many people have credit cards. Card ownership was very low when mobile options like Alipay and WeChat Pay were introduced. So this is, very different from the Western countries, right? Where people still stick with cash or credit card. The situation in, in China is quite unique. Consumers, they're sort of leapfrog credit cards, shifting directly from cash to mobile payments. So, so that's why, okay? So that explains the jump in transaction volume of mobile payment. And I would say it will grow further for sure because after the COVID outbreak, the pandemic outbreak, people right now prefer less physical interaction, right? Nobody wants to touch anything, including coins and notes. So the, 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 the percentage of that would just grow further, that is for sure. So put it simply, the infrastructure is already there, right? And the technology is already there. Everything is there and habits have already been nurtured. So all this provide very good foundations for the government to promote the e-currency, right? Next slide, please. In terms of market share, shares of mobile payment, 
Right now, more than half was handled by Alipay, followed by TangPay, which includes WeChat Pay. But uh, before I move on, I want to stress that we have to be careful here because theoretically speaking, the e B is not equivalent to the existing third-party payment functions. Alipay and TangPay processed claims on the bank account, much like a debit card or credit card. So theoretically speaking, they are operating at an M2 level of money supply. But in contrast, the e B is a digital fiat money. It is classified as M0. All right, but in the longer term, if e B gains acceptance, uh, you know, when more and more people using it, it would evolve over time, just like how Alipay evolved over the, over the years. Like seven or eight years ago, Alipay asked people to transfer the unused cash into a money market fund, right? If you can still remember. And once they did, things changed dramatically. Uh, E-wallet has become a huge money market fund, which is called Yuabao. And Yuabao right now is uh, one of the largest money market funds in the world, right? And this is exactly another reason why the PBOC want to launch the e B Because we all know that money market fund are different from those in other countries. They tend to be more leveraged. Okay, for instance, some banks uh, reinvested money market funds in high risk products, and some of them are often hard to track because they are not even being included in commercial banks' balance sheets, right? They are not even counted as M2. It's been a headache for the PBOC, right? And of course, the regulators did not, did not just sit on their hands. They have, they have taken many measures to address the problems. Uh, like in, in 2018, they set up a clearing house specifically for big tech firms, and that clearing house is called Nat Yulian Clearing. I put out a chart on slide 16. So as you can see there, the red circle name Nat's Union Clearing, right? So right now, the whole thing is just like a two-tier clearing system. And since then, the PBOC can monitor customer funds on third-party payment platforms, right? Which is good. But now, with the eRMB, things will get even better because the PBOC will have total visibility on what's happening in the economy, even before that transaction is done, not after, all right? And uh, there are also macro implications, uh, which is everything will be more transparent more accurate, such as the measurement of currency supply, uh, circulation speed, currency money multipliers, and distribution of money. And all of this info will, would be very useful for formulating monetary policy, right? So potentially, it could make everything more efficient, uh, for instance, to reduce bad debt, right? Uh, and the e B could also, of course, tackle other problems like money laundering, tax evasion, corruption, and terrorist financing as well. Uh, but then, of course, when it comes to the issue of privacy, how to strike a balance is, is challenging, it's always tricky. And in fact, this is not just a problem the PBOC is facing, but in fact, this is one of the most controversial topics amongst other central banks that are working on, on uh, CBDC such as the Fed, the uh, BOE, BOJ, and ECB, right? And in fact, BC, uh, BOJ and ECB are working on a joint project called Project Stella, in which one of, one of the topics is to, like, how to provide citizens with the same level of anonymity as cash, okay? Or you can say maybe this is exactly the edge of China over the other countries, right? Because if the Chinese government wants, wants it to happen, they could make it happen and they could make it happen fast. On the contrary, in some of the Western countries, uh, any new law needs to be passed by a lot of regulatory bodies and the Congress, right? So maybe this is one of the edges that uh, uh, China is having, all right? Uh, 
So maybe I stop here first. I will pass it back to Tamo. Um, thanks, Nathan. Uh, I think I'll pass it back to Kenneth. Uh, I think Kenneth is going to handle the Q and A, or is that the way we're going to do it, Kenneth? Um, yeah, um, we can. Um, or if you if if you would like to um, um, talk on any specific part of the um, presentation so far. Well, I just wanted to make one point that uh, to those of you who subscribe to The Economist, you probably saw with the Ant Financial IPO forthcoming, The Economist had a big story about, again, how the nature of fintech, or as Jack Ma sort of turned around called it tech fin, uh, how, how that's sort of you know influencing uh, market making, uh, entire sort of you know capital market evolve evolution in China. Uh, given how, how large it is. I mean, you know, when you talk about China, it's like the largest mutual fund in the world, largest insurance company in the world, largest market maker, everything is there. And the likes of Ant are embodying uh, those issues in, in a very uh, sort of, you know, profound manner. Uh, mm -hmm. And um, so it's, it's, although today's seminar is primarily about digital currencies, but this entire financial technology aspect beyond the issue of digital currency is also going to have, uh, play a very complementary role in the future of digital currencies in our view. So, I mean, today we've covered a fairly large, uh, broad spectrum of topics all within this digital currency realm, right? Um, but, um, and we've talked a lot about how China um, is at the forefront of the um, digital currencies, for an example. But um, I'll, just for the audience, I'd like to bring them back just even closer to home. Um, just a few weeks ago, um, Olam has done a bond issue and that bond issue was done on a blockchain, um, working together with SGX. These these examples are actually coming back um, to, to to our markets um, on the back of what Nathan, uh, Taimo, and uh, Wei Liang have um, talked about. Uh, perhaps we can open this up to the floor and see whether there are any questions from the floor. If there are no questions, perhaps we can actually bring this, um, maybe I can start off by bringing this closer to home. So we, as as um, Nathan, you've talked about how um, central bank digital currency is advancing really quickly uh, with uh, within China. Um, can one of you perhaps take a, um, talk a little bit about how it's progressing within Singapore? Well, I think uh, MAS is, will certainly not be as adventurous as PBOC and uh, will be very, very deliberate and thorough before it sort of gets into the act of actual issuance of digital currency. So I think what we've seen in the case of MAS over the last four or five years is that uh, it has been a champion of blockchain technology and has worked with DBS and other large financial institutions in Singapore to examine whether it is uh, liquidity or trade finance or for that matter, bond issuance, whether some of these things can be facilitated further by the introduction of a blockchain technology. Uh, we've also seen, of course, uh, everybody knows that, that MS has been also allowing digital banks to come and operate in Singapore. And there have been quite a few companies that have bid for licenses there. So whether it is on blockchain or on digital banking, uh, MS is a champion. Uh, the issue related to actual digital currency is a slightly you know separate one in the case of china the ermb as you know nathan sort of uh, uh, pointed that out is born out of necessity mm. the way financial technology companies in china are taking on deposits creating money market uh, multiplier within their own ecosystem in a way the central bank in china was uh, fearful of losing control over money supply i think and um, monetary institution like MS has no worries in that regard. They're firmly in control of the money supply in Singapore, regardless of the proliferation of e-commerce in this country. Okay. So the digital clearing house that the Chinese are setting up, and again, you saw the diagram in one of Nathan's charts, is uh, an illustration of the authorities' efforts to bring back control. Mm 
that with greater transparency, uh, having the digital clearinghouse would allow all transactions, even without a blockchain, to be visible, to be transparent. And then from a central bank perspective or a monetary authority perspective, you actually have a greater degree of oversight. So this is kind of the big frontier going forward, whether it is the regulation of big tech or the transparency and oversight required of currencies in the digital space by monetary authorities. Uh, and, and there, I'm sure, MS will be as quick or as uh, comprehensive in its regulation as the PPOC would be. Yeah. Of course, this field is, of course, growing very, very quickly. Um, I understand from Wei Liang's um, early presentation where he talked about um, one of the main key features behind a cryptocurrency or a digital currency is that it's going to be distributed. And yet, if you look at what central banks are doing, a lot of it is centralizing power and 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 concentrating uh, and 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 looking at it from from that point of view, rather than a distributed and decentralized system. Um, so lots of lots of different moving parts here. Right. So I suppose the one thing that we have reached the point of no return is some of the visibility or tracking capability that uh, cryptos have provided. Um, I think that the central banks will not be able to turn away from that. I think that mm. is here to stay. And, you know, if you talk to some of the large uh, sort of the Bitcoin asset managers in the world, they will bristle at the notion that, you know, Bitcoin is traded in a completely anonymous basis. I think the term they like to use is pseudonymous basis, that you can use a pseudonym to do it. And, and there are ways to track the ways to backtrack transactions if an authority wants it to be. Uh, and I think they are trying to push this angle as forcefully as possible to take some of the stigma associated with cryptocurrencies that have sort of arisen in the recent years that they were primarily used for illicit transactions. And the counter to that is actually, it's not that illicit and it's not that non-transparent. Yeah. Um, do I have any further questions from the floor? Um, I was wondering, with the emergence of e-currencies, so you mentioned the e RMB, the e-Krona, um, what will happen with the cryptocurrencies that are out there right now? So, for example, Bitcoin or Ethereum, will they become irrelevant or will they overwhelmingly grow in popularity? So, as you saw this year, when sort of there was quite a bit of risk aversion and flight to safety around the panic of March, April. We saw a big pickup in uh, cryptocurrency, particularly Ripple and Bitcoin prices. Mm -hmm. And that's probably the first time we've seen some degree of uh, safe haven phenomenon associated with cryptocurrencies, that there is a degree of confidence in their limited circulation as opposed to the circulation of a large number of reserve currencies, which will expand very sharply as part of the COVID pandemic response. Uh, but that's been a you know small period. I mean, since then, I don't think you can make a very strong argument that uh, Bitcoin is the new gold, although I'm sure Bitcoin issuers uh, or players would like to uh, push that very hard. But, but there's certainly this notion that if you can come up with a set of formula and algorithm that will control the circulation of a currency and that has what Will Young pointed out earlier a network effect that lots of people use it then the value and the usefulness of that limited circulation currency would rise uh, and the appeal would be substantial especially at a time when you have a lot of money printing going on and there is worry about, you know, where does this, you know, debt bench that a lot of these countries in the world are being forced to take on. Now, our view has always been, and I think both Nathan and William would agree with me, that we will never see cryptocurrencies as a substitute for fiat currency. But just like gold since the early 70s has not been a substitute for fiat currency, but they have been a store of value. So that's the most important part, that for ease of transaction and credibility associated with the circulation cap can cryptocurrencies make the case that they are useful? Uh, it, they're easy to use, they're widely accepted, and there is no risk of them being inflated away by you know, irresponsible printing. And for the time being, they are you know, converging in that direction, that you know, usage is increasing, acceptability is increasing. Um, and they are uh, certainly, in the case of Bitcoin, very clear uh, limits on its circulation uh, or issuance. So, so, so from that perspective, uh, whether China comes with an ERMB or you know, Riksbank does an e-Krona, in our view, 
they can operate in two separate universes. Yeah. One is by a central bank to wrest control of money supply. And perhaps also if you go one step further in terms of applicability is to find simpler, easier ways of distributing transfer payments to the population. And I think in <laughs> countries where there is significant uh, degree of underbanking going on, countries where the banking system has not reached out to everybody, I think there is a use case for an e-currency which can be distributed through phone lines, for example, for cell phones, for example. Uh, but the use case, the appeal of crypto, even in that case, is separate and remains valid. And then if you think about a country like Venezuela or some other country which is facing a lot of political stress and is going through bouts of hyperinflation, perhaps one of those countries in the coming years or decades would adopt, instead of adopting the dollar or the gold as an anchor for their currency issuance, use one of these cryptos. Um, I find it easier to do than within the oversight of the US Federal Reserve. So there are you know, political dimensions at play as well, which might keep the interest, mm -hmm. even at the sovereign level, for cryptocurrencies alive. Hi, Thank it's you so much. Oh, sorry. So I thought that you finished uh, the discussion. Apologize. Go ahead, Cedric. Go ahead, Cedric. Okay, so it, it's it's Cedric Jensen from BitSpread. Uh, thank you for the presentation, first of all. Very, very nice. I had a question, which is uh, regarding those digital, uh, central digital currency, central bank digital currency. From your, you know, from, from what you hear in the markets, do you think those uh, central uh, bank digital currency are going to be issued out of the Ethereum blockchain or which which blockchain do you think is going to be um, uh, used for each and every of them? So, you know, it, it, so far it doesn't seem like to me that there is any major sort of news coming out of any of the central banks in the world that they're going to use a blockchain based solution for their own CBDCs because their point is that, you know, we are the issuer of the currency and you trust us because we represent the sovereign. So we don't need to go into a blockchain to establish credibility, which a private currency would need. But that's my sort of understanding. William, would you like to weigh in on this issue? So um, none of the central banks have published uh, any kind of uh, insights into whether or not they'll use a private blockchain. But my understanding is that Blockchain is essentially just software, right? So there's, very, there's really nothing to stop central banks from writing its own Ethereum-like uh, uh, blockchain network and calling it something else. Because fundamentally, the code is going to be very similar. They could just reference the implementation that Ethereum has put out or blockchain as uh, Bitcoin has put out. And, and really, there's, no, um, there's still no real economic need for them to base it on Ethereum or you know, on on uh, on some pre-existing implementations. Okay, thank you. And for China, actually, uh, as far as I know, uh, the CBDC in China has borrowed some of the concepts in blockchain technology, but not all of them, because it is hard for the PBOC to uh, fully apply technology to CBDC as the because the existing technology cannot handle a large volume of simultaneous transactions. I think this is uh, particularly true for China, because for instance, in China, uh, the annual single stay happened in 11th November, right? Uh, that payment demand is very huge, right? Uh, it's more than 92,000 transactions per second. So that is far above what Bitcoin's blockchain could support. High concurrency that will that will that will take place. So that's why for for the uh, you know in in the PBOC case they relied on something else. So they have to invent something else. No, that's right. Nothing. I mean, look. I mean, in terms of pace of settlement and accuracy of settlement, I think the real time growth settlement technology or the framework that the Bank of England and Federal Reserve and everybody has in the world, it is going to be very, very difficult for any sort of you know private sector solution to come anywhere near replicating them. I think Ben Broadbent, who's the deputy governor of Bank of England, once had pointed out that just the Bank of England alone every day clears 
tens of billions of dollars worth of and hundreds of millions of uh, transactions with Six Sigma accuracy with like, you know, a fraction of a penny cost. Um, and, and that sort of speed and accuracy is, is very difficult to uh, replicate uh, unless, you know, we have some, I don't know, quantum uh, computing uh, development or something like that. Exactly. Thanks, Cedric. Um, any further questions? Hello? Yep. Hi, I had a question. First of all, great presentation. I really, really uh, enjoyed it, especially the China angle. My question is in reference to slide 12 about the um, hash rate, the monthly hash rate. Yes. Do you see that changing at all where, you know, whether it's Russia or Kazakhstan or even the U.S. comes closer to China's um, numbers? Okay. Uh, I think in the near term, China will continue to continue to lead based on a couple of reasons. One of them is, and a major reason is the cheap electricity available there, right? Uh, and Chinese miners are closer in proximity and relation to mining hardware manufacturers, most of whom are also Chinese. So this is another important point. Uh, because we have to know it is very common for large Chinese miners to have VIP accounts at the, at the large hardware manufacturers and, and therefore uh, getting preferential access to the first batches of new gear, for instance, okay? So this is, this is the reason why China will continue to lead in the near term, but it, there's no guarantee in the longer term. And it is not necessarily true for sure in the longer term. Because as far as I know, the latest generation hardware uh, of mining is expected to make an entry into the non-Chinese market. So this is kind of a, a breakthrough. And, and uh, uh, other politically stable and well-connected countries like some countries in Europe, like Norway, right? They have abundant hydro power potential, are likely to become mining powerhouses as well. Uh, and recent news, one of the recent news is that hardware company, Beat Main, uh, they have already, they, they're already building the world's largest Bitcoin mining farm in Texas, which also has abundant power resources. So. Put it simply, I would say near term, China will continue to lead, but there's no not there's no guarantee in the longer term. Okay, great. Thank you very much. Oh. Thank you. Thank you very much for that question. Um, anybody else? Yeah, hi. I, um, quick question. Does quantum computing um, pose a threat then to blockchain? Um, is it create vulnerability? Well, you want to take this? Um, so let me try. Uh, <laughs> I think so. My understanding of quantum computing is quite limited, uh, but there is, I think, a lot of scientific work being performed now in terms of uh, the implications of the uh, quantum computers in terms of cracking uh, cryptographic algorithms, uh, which obviously uh, your Bitcoin and Ethereum, these are very reliant on uh, crypto algorithms. So, so if quantum computing can provide some kind of breakthrough, then it could threaten the security of, uh, of uh, cryptocurrencies. But right now, the understanding is that um, no, we are not so close to that possibility just yet. Uh, quantum computing is still very much in the uh, infancy stage. There's uh, progress being made, but it's nowhere uh, close to cracking the most sophisticated uh, cryptographic algorithms that's, that the market is using right now. So I would say it's, it is an area to watch maybe in the next decade or so, but at this present moment, um, the consensus view is that uh, probably it's not going to be a big threat uh, for now, uh, and also at the same point, Bitcoin is not a dead software, right? So there are developers working on it 24-7. Uh, they're plugging security vulnerabilities. So I would imagine that 
if um, over the near term there's some new breakthrough that could come and threaten uh, whatever algorithms are being used, uh, the developers will probably switch uh, the software to use a different cryptographic algorithm that's more uh, that's probably more secure. So, so this is an area I think that 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 there's of some interest, but there's nothing conclusive right now. I also Thank you. think that successful, uh, you know, uh, innovation in that area, which puts cryptography to uh, shambles, would create much bigger problem than just currency. I mean, from global defense network to satellite networks, everything would be vulnerable. Uh, and as I, William said, I think this is still a science lab matter as opposed to having any near term uh, serious implication for application. Thanks. Thanks for the question. Um, anybody else? Um, I'm conscious that we are at a little bit past four o'clock. Uh, perhaps one last question, if there's any. Okay. On that note, um, I would like to thank Taimo, Nathan, um, Wei Liang. Uh, for um, on, on, on the presentation um, and a very interesting Q&A. And thanks everybody else uh, for coming and attending and participating in this. Uh, as I said, um, DBS, we intend to uh, continue to champion this space, uh, to grow an ecosystem and to grow a community of interested parties um, um, that's interested in digital investments, digital assets, um, central bank and uh, digital currencies. Um, and there will be more of these coming through. In fact, um, tomorrow um, we have um, David uh, David Lee. Um, he's a well-known subject matter expert um, in this area as well. Um, he's a consultant uh, to Libra, um, Facebook currency, um, um, amongst other things. Uh, and he's going to be talking about a very interesting topic, uh, which is um, how cryptocurrencies uh, is going to transform um, stock brokerage as well as the securities industry. Um, so that, um, um, that's a topic for tomorrow. If you have any questions from today, or if you have any um, thoughts that you would like to um, um, express, uh, please reach out to your salesperson at DBS Vickers, um, or just reach out to any of us. We'll be very, very happy to take your questions or any suggestions uh, for future events as well. Uh, once again, um, thank you, thank you. Um, thanks to everybody attending uh, today's talk. Thanks very much. Thank you. Bye-bye, everybody. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks.